From just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church in Northern Virginia, thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. I'm Ken Miller. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net or rolw.org. At our website, you can get information about the church, the media ministry, the outreach ministries, the missions outreach, the Bible college, and various coming events. Our mailing address is Post Office Box 772, Annandale, Virginia, 22003. Our meeting location is 45449 East Severn Way, Sterling, Virginia. Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. God bless you. We do have a, a monthly healing service, and it's the fourth Saturday of every month, and it's usually across the street at the Suburban Hotel, and this month it will be also. In August, I think it'll be here, because we're going to have Terry Tripp here, and we'll probably do both Saturday and Sunday right here for the August meeting. But if you need a healing, you know God promises healing. In fact, next Sunday, my sermon next Sunday will be about healing, I believe. I'm going to take a little bit of a break from the Sermon on the Mount for the next two weeks. Next week, I'll talk about healing. Two weeks from now, we're going to have a guest speaker. And so it'll be three weeks from now when I get back to the Sermon on the Mount. But, but healing is very important. You know, the, healing is something that Jesus emphasized a lot, or Jesus did heal a lot in his ministry. And the Bible talks a lot about it. And, and you know, it, it bothers me that so many Christians just accept sickness. Whenever sickness happens, they just accept it as part of life. But we should understand that being in covenant with God, we don't have to just accept sickness. We can overcome sickness. We have authority over the elements of this world. And we need to believe that. We need to believe that the Bible means what it says. But anyway, that's not my sermon for today. <laughs> but I will get into that next week because I, I think that most Christians just don't really realize their rights in Christ. Most Christians don't realize who they are in Christ. Most Christians don't realize what they have in Christ. We're in Matthew chapter 6 today, and beginning in verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I just ask you, Lord, that each person who is here and those who hear this message either through the TV or through live stream or on the internet, we just ask, Lord, that each person hear what you are saying to the church, what you are saying to them, and not just the words that come out of my mouth, but let them hear what the Spirit is saying to their heart and help each person to be receptive of the truths from your word and from your spirit. And I just ask you, Lord, to speak through me according to your perfect will in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. So, so now we come to a set of scriptures. We've been going through Matthew. Matthew. We went through Matthew 5. We went th we're going through Matthew 6. We're about halfway through Matthew 6. Now we come to a set of scriptures where he seems to be talking about finances. And I actually changed my mind about half a dozen times as far as what the title of this sermon should be. I f first thought, well, it's New Covenant Finances. But a lot of what he's saying here really doesn't specifically have to do with money, I think. But it's really a matter of what your heart is focused on. Are you focused on your economy or are you focused on God's economy? Are you focused on the riches of this world or are you focused on the true riches, the riches of God, the riches of heaven? But you know, money or the lack of it is the number one cause for stress for Americans. It's the number one cause for stress. Why would that be? <laughs> I think money is just simply too important to most people. But yet 40% of the world population lives on less than $2 a day. Did you realize that? Less than $2 a day. So, you know, sure, money is important, but you don't, you don't really need money. <laughs> Let me be careful how I say this. You don't really need money, but you need what money buys, right? You know, I, you might say, well, I need money so I can put food on the table. Well, you don't really need the money. You just need the food that the money can buy. 
you don't really need money. You need the gas that the money can buy. So I, I think we're just too focused on money in our society. But, you know, you don't have to have money for money to have power over you. Sometimes the most money-obsessed people are the people that don't have any because we're trying to get more. We're trying to get money or we're trying to get more. This isn't a sermon against money. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, I believe very strongly in prosperity. I believe very strongly. In fact, there are 2,350 verses on money in the New Testament. That's more than on any other single subject. There's more talk in the New Testament, more verses on, in the New Testament on money than, than any other subject. And so why is there so much Bible discussion about money and finances? Well, God knows our heart. But, you know, as we've been going through Matthew chapter 6, we've seen Jesus focus on different things. He talked about doing good works, but the point, his point in everything that he's talking about so far in Matthew chapter 6 is that you not, not do things for the purpose of being seen by men. You don't do whatever you do for the kingdom of God. Don't do it for the purpose of man's recognition or man's acknowledgement. You know, do good works prompted by your spirit, not for the recognition of men. If the only reason you do what you do, as far as good works, is for the recognition of men, Jesus said, you have your reward. And he went on to talk about prayer. When you pray, if you're praying in public to, for the purpose of being seen and being recognized by men, Jesus said, you have your reward. If you fast for the purpose of recognition of men if you fast and and you you let everybody know i'm fasting but perhaps by either through words you speak or through actions you take or the way you dress down to make yourself look like you're miserable <laughs> you know if you're fasting for the purpose of being seen by men jesus said you have your reward so now he ta he's talking about money and and you know there's people that that want you to know that they're a generous giver <laughs> You know, and Jesus says they have the reward. When when people give for, you know, I've been in churches, you probably have too, where they have plaques on the wall of people that have given thousands of dollars or sometimes they have name plates on the back of chairs uh, as a recognition of who helped provide those chairs. And, you know, so I, I always think in my mind of this sermon, what Jesus was saying, they have the reward. If you're doing anything for the recognition of men, if you're broadcasting how generous you are, <laughs> he's saying you have your reward. In these scriptures that we're coming to today, l let me make it clear, it's not about money, or it's not all about money. He starts talking about what you treasure, what you treasure. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasure upon the earth. What is it that you treasure? Is it money that you treasure? Is it possessions that you treasure? It's not just about money, it's about your, your, your time, your talents, and your treasures. If isolated from the rest of God's word, there are some scriptures that appear on the surface as if God is speaking against money, but he is not speaking against money. In fact, there are plenty of scriptures where he tells us that he wants to bless us even financially. There are many scriptures that, that speak of the fact that he wants to bless us. He wants, and there's places where it speaks of riches as a blessing. But what Jesus does here is he presents two ways to live with your money. He presents two ways to live with your money, and there's no middle, he doesn't present a middle ground. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. It's not that we can't have treasure on earth. That's not the point, and, but it shouldn't be our focus. Your focus shouldn't be on the things on the earth. There's so many things that we spend our, our money on, and yet they have no or very little lasting value. You know, things break down. You spend a lot of money on, on a car or, or a phone or television or whatever you spend your money on, and things break down or things get stolen. Things end up needing to be replaced. Jesus just got done talking about prayer, and in, in what we call the Lord's Prayer, one thing he said is, give us this day our daily bread. So part of trusting God, part of walking with God is trusting him, learning to trust him on a daily basis. It doesn't matter how much money is in my bank account or how much possessions I have or how big or, or, or nice of a house I have. What is my focus? Is my focus on my possessions? Is my focus on my money? Or is my focus on Jesus? 
He wants us to trust him on a daily basis. And we'll learn this more three weeks from now when I get to those last 10 verses of chapter 6. This is re-emphasized again as far as uh, where he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about anything in the future. Just trust God today. Seek first today. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. And then in verse 34, he says, sufficient for today is the evil thereof. And we'll talk about what he meant by that. But, but the point is, we need to trust him on a daily basis. Give us this day our daily bread. And that's what we learned from the manna in the wilderness. Remember that? Where they were given a daily supply. They weren't supposed to hoard up manna for the next day unless it was the day before the sabbath and you know so they were supposed to trust god for a daily provision and that's what he wants us to do today so he says lay not lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal but what does he mean by this? You know what the problem is? The problem is simply, and you're probably going to say, well, that's just too simplistic. The problem is a lack of faith. <laughs> we just don't trust God. I know we say we trust God. We try to trust God. We think we're trusting God. But, in, but if there's any worry in your life, any worry in your mind about your future, to the degree that there's worry, you're not fully trusting God. There, there is a lack of intellectual persuasion that God truly supplies all of our needs. We know the Bible says that, but I think that there's a lack of persuasion in our mind that God means what he says. There's a lack of persuasion in the power of God. There's a lack of persuasion that he truly is Jehovah Jireh. He truly is the God who meets all of our needs. He goes on to say in verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wow. In other words, you will invest your money <laughs> in the things that are important to you. Where your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So all of us intuitively know this is true. And we like to say that we treasure our family. We like to say that we treasure our church. We like to say that we treasure the things of God. But one could find out the things that you truly treasure by looking at your bank account. You know, it, and if you, if you place, you know, you're going to spend money on things that are important to you. <laughs> you know, and again, I don't take this as condemnation. There certainly is no condemnation. But, but where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you place a lot of value on money, it'll be hard for you to give it away. If you place a lot of value on money, it'll be hard for you to give, give it away. If your, car, if your car is the pride of your life, you'll be destroyed when it gets destroyed. If, you, if your phone is what's most important to you in your, li in your life, like it is now for most or <laughs> so many people, because the phone is no longer just a phone. A phone is everything, right? Or, or my iPad, you know. My, I, sometimes I say my iPad is everything because it's, it's got my calendar. I, it's my, it has my agenda for, for every day. It has my Bible. <laughs> I use my iPad for my Bible now. My iPad basically does everything for me. So uh, if, if I were to lose my iPad, what would happen to me? The things that we value in this life, sometimes they just simply don't work. Sometimes they get stolen. Sometimes they break down. But Jesus is trying to direct us towards what is truly important? What is truly important to you? The things of this world or the things of God? And then he goes on to say in verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. Now this, I have always been really, or not always, but for a long time I was really puzzled by verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. What in the world does that mean? Have you ever looked at this verse and think, I have no idea what Jesus is talking about here? The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body is full of light. Well, he's not talking about your physical eye. He's talking about the eye of discernment. The idea here is to be single-minded on the things that are truly important. 
instead of living in the economy of, of the world, money and possessions, live in the economy of the kingdom of God, grace, faith, love, mercy. Live in the economy of the kingdom of God. Is your focus on accumulating and gaining more, a more luxurious lifestyle or giving out from your abundance to be a blessing to others? That's God's economy. Whatever God has blessed you with, thank God for it, but use it to be a blessing to others. John Wesley once said, having first gained all you can, then saved all you can, then give all you can. That's God's economy. Dr. Livingston was a well-known explorer and missionary in the 1800s. He gave his life to be a missionary in Africa. He went where nobody else wanted to go. He invested his life into people. And he said, I will place no value on anything I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of Christ. That's God's economy. The reason for not laying up treasure on earth is so that we will not have our hearts drawn away from the things of God. If you're focused on the things of this world, and again, let me make it clear, I'm certainly for prosperity. I believe God's word is for prosperity. But the problem is when we get too focused on the prosperity and we are distracted from the things of God. In fact, a key to success in the kingdom of God is this single eye that Jesus is talking about here in this verse. To have that single eye, to have a single focus on the things of God. And most of us don't have the capacity really to, do our, to, to be our best at two things at the same time. So he wants us to be single-minded, single-eyed, single-focused on him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There is a scripture in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, that says the blessing of the Lord makes rich. So we're, we're, we're certainly not against you being rich. In fact, I pray that you all become rich or richer than what you are. <laughs> this, this, this would be a blessing for each one of us. But, but the blessing of the Lord makes, makes us rich and adds no sorrow with it. You see, if you go man's way towards riches by chasing after the riches, there tends to be sorrow that comes along with it and strife and stress. But if you're just single focused on Jesus, single, single focused on the things of God, he will bless you. He promises he'll bless you and there won't be any sorrow with it. There shouldn't be any stress with it. There shouldn't be any negative side effects <laughs> with the blessings of God. It's when we covet after money that we pierce ourselves with many sorrows. But Jesus was speaking in, in, this, in this scripture here about spiritual vision, spiritual vision. If we keep our attention, our eye, single upon Jesus and his word, then all that we do will be filled with his light or filled with his guiding hand, we could say. Verse 22 says, but if thine eye be evil, that's an interesting word that he throws in here. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now let's focus on verse 23 here because if thine eye be evil, do any of us have an evil eye? I don't, I don't think any of us really have an evil eye. So what's he saying here? It, it's, this is the wording in the King James Version. Now, if you're looking in any other translation, you probably see different wording. Uh, for example, in the NIV, it says, if your eye is unhealthy. Maybe that's a better translation. Or the Berean Study Bible says, if your eye be bad. I like what I saw in the Amplified Bible where it says, if your eye is spiritually blind. I think that's probably a better concept of what he's talking about. Not, not evil in the sense of really being mean and, and bad, but, but spiritually blind. If your, eye, if your spiritual eye is spiritually blind, the whole body will be full of darkness. He goes on to say that if therefore you're the light that is in thee. So he's talking to believers. 
He's saying there is a light. He's not talking to unbelievers here. If the light that is in you, and we looked in chapter 5 where we saw that Jesus said, you are the light, let that light shine. So it's possible to be the light of the world or have that light of God, light of Jesus on the inside of you, and, and yet you're quenching that light. You're, you're covering over that light. You're not letting that light shine. So he's saying here, if, if, if you're not single-minded on Jesus, if you're not focused on Jesus, you're not fully letting your light shine. The, if, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, or dark gunned, we could say, how great is that darkness? Well, how does this happen? Well, when we value the wrong things, it filters our judgment, it filters our beliefs, and it filters our thoughts. If we're focused on the wrong things, we're going to be distracted from the things of God, and the light will not be shining the way it should be shining. The key to victory in the Christian life, I believe, is singleness of purpose. We get this, this idea from something that Paul told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3. He says that not as though I've already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to the things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This, these three verses present the idea that Paul is saying, nothing is going to distract me from the things of God. I am pressing forward. I don't care how people, how radical people think that I am. <laughs> I am going to press forward to the things of God. I'm going to forget the things which are behind me. I'm going to forget yesterday and, and my past mistakes, and I'm going to press forward to the things of God. I'm going to be single-minded, single-focused on Jesus and on his word and on the things of God. And there's life-transforming power in that kind of focus, single-minded, single-focused on Jesus, on his word, and the things that he has in store for us. It's, it's like a laser. You know, the strength of a laser lies in the fact that all the light is concentrated on one single point. And likewise, the strength of a Christian lies in how single his vision is on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So in, in these verses, Jesus is contrasting what he called, or what the King James calls an evil eye, or a darkened eye, or a spiritually blind eye, <laughs> with a single eye. So the, the evil or spiritually blind eye is simply when we allow our thoughts to be on anything less than Jesus, on anything other than Jesus. As light is symbolic of God and his kingdom, the darkness is symbolic of anything outside the kingdom of God. Not having our minds stayed on Jesus allows other influences, inroads into our lives. If we're setting our affections on the things of this earth, then unfruitful works of darkness will dominate, dominate us and, and life will never truly be fully fulfilling. Let me say that again. If we're setting our affections on things on this earth, then unfruitful works of darkness will dominate us and life will never be truly, fully fulfilling. People chase after things in this life and they think these things will give them fulfillment. You know, just, I just need to get a, the latest flat screen TV. <laughs> we were talking about TVs earlier. Or I have to get the latest model of, of, of iPhones or the latest, you know, the, a newer and better car, a newer and better house. We chase after things thinking that's going to be fulfilling, but it never fully fulfills us. As long as we're focused on things as a source of fulfillment, we're never going to be fulfilled. The only way to truly be fulfilled is to chase after the things of God. Just focus on Jesus, focus on his word, focus on the things of God. It, going back to Matthew chapter 6, in verse 24, he says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the Aramaic word for money. So he's saying God and money. One will be your master, and you'll use one to serve the other. But you can't serve both at the same time. It's God or mammon, God or money. Is, is money the primary? You might say, well, I, 
I think I'm chasing after God, but you know, money is still very important. But is money the primary filter in your decision making? You know, I've been guilty of this, and I'm sure most of us have, saying, well, I just can't afford that. And if, if affordability is the primary objective or the primary filter as far as what you're going to do or what you're not going to do, perhaps money has too much control on your life. I don't allow myself to say I can't afford things because my dad's rich. Amen? And you've got the same dad I do, so you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> You know, God is rich. My spiritual dad, my spiritual father is so rich, there's nothing I can't afford. So affordability is not the issue. Is money the primary reason for stress and anxiety in your life? If money is the primary reason for stress and anxiety in your life, then perhaps you're too focused on money. Do you, do you find it hard to give generously? Do you have consumer debt. Now let me, I think we all probably have consumer debt. Do you have excessive consumer debt? To the degree that you're in debt, you're, you could say you're kind of a slave to those payments, right? You're a slave to the payments that you have to make every month. Debt to some degree is probably unavoidable in America. You know, to the degree that you're in debt, you're a slave to those payments. So don't be so focused on the finances. Be more focused on Jesus. There's a scripture in Proverbs chapter 19 that Proverbs 19, 17, that says, He that has pity on the poor lendeth to the Lord. Another translation says, He that gives to the poor lends to the Lord. And that which he hath given shall God pay him back. So, in other words, if, if somebody asks you for money, just give it. Okay? Now, there, there there's a little bit of wisdom that needs to be used to balance that. I'm not just saying give all your money away, but, but if somebody asks, if somebody ha is in need, give it, not expecting anything in return from that person. God says he will pay you back. Okay, so from your perspective, you're just giving the money away, but God sees it almost like a loan where you're, you know, you're giving it to him, but God's going to pay you back. And I believe God means what he says in scripture. You know, he's not a man that he should lie. If he says he's going to pay you back, he's going to pay you back. Again, what I said earlier, our, our biggest problem, I think, is that we just simply don't believe. In our heart of hearts, we don't believe that God really means what he says. If we believe God... From just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church in Northern Virginia, thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. I'm Ken Miller. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net or rolw.org. At our website, you can get information about the church, the media ministry, the outreach ministries, the, the missions outreach, the Bible college, and various coming events. Our mailing address is Post Office Box 772, Annandale, Virginia, 22003. Our meeting location is 45449 East Severn Way, Sterling, Virginia. Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. God bless you. I like what I saw in the Amplified Bible where it says, if your eye is spiritually blind. I think that's probably a better concept of what he's talking about. Not, not evil in the sense of really being mean and, and bad, but, but spiritually blind. If your, eye, if your spiritual eye is spiritually blind, the whole body will be full of darkness. He goes on to say that if therefore you're the light that is in thee. So he's talking to believers. He's saying there is a light. He's not talking to unbelievers here. If the light that is in you, and we looked in chapter 5 where we saw that Jesus said, you are the light, let that light shine. So it's possible to be the light of the world or have that light of God, light of Jesus on the inside of you, and, and yet you're quenching that light, you're you're covering over that light you're not letting that light shine so he's saying here if 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 you're not single-minded on Jesus if you're not focused on Jesus you're not fully letting your light shine the if if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness or dark gunned we could say how great is that darkness well, how does this happen well when we value the wrong things it filters our judgment it filters our beliefs and it filters our thoughts. If we're focused on the wrong things, we're going to be distracted from the things of God and the light will not be shining the way it should be shining. 
The key to victory in the Christian life, I believe, is singleness of purpose. We get this, this idea from something that Paul told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3. He says that not as though I've already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to the things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This, these three verses present the idea that Paul is saying, nothing is going to distract me from the things of God. I am pressing forward. I don't care how people, how radical people think that I am. <laughs> I am going to press forward to the things of God. I'm going to forget the things which are behind me. I'm going to forget yesterday and, and my past mistakes, and I'm going to press forward to the things of God. I'm going to be single-minded, single-focused on Jesus and on his word and on the things of God. And there's life-transforming power in that kind of focus, single-minded, single-focused on Jesus, on his word, and the things that he has in store for us. It's, it's like a laser. You know, the strength of a laser lies in the fact that all the light is concentrated on one single point. And likewise, the strength of a Christian lies in how single his vision is on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So in, in these verses, Jesus is contrasting what he called, or what the King James calls an evil eye, or a darkened eye, or a spiritually blind eye, <laughs> with a single eye. So the, the evil or spiritually blind eye is simply when we allow our thoughts to be on anything less than Jesus, on anything other than Jesus. As light is symbolic of God and his kingdom, the darkness is symbolic of anything outside the kingdom of God. If we're, you know, not having our minds stayed on Jesus allows other influences, inroads into our lives. If we're setting our affections on the things of this earth, then unfruitful works of darkness will dominate, dominate us and, and life will never truly be fully fulfilling. Let me say that again. If we're setting our affections on things on this earth, then unfruitful works of darkness will dominate us and life will never be truly, fully fulfilling. People chase after things in this life, and they think these things will give them fulfillment. You know, just, I just need to get a, the, the latest flat screen TV. <laughs> we were talking about TVs earlier. Or I have to get the latest model of, of, of iPhones, or the latest, you know, the, a newer and better car, a newer and better house. We chase after things thinking that's going to be fulfilling, but it never fully fulfills us. As long as we're focused on things as a source of fulfillment, we're never going to be fulfilled. The only way to truly be fulfilled is to chase after the things of God. Just focus on Jesus, focus on his word, focus on the things of God. Going back to Matthew chapter 6, in verse 24, he says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the Aramaic word for money. So he's saying God and money. One will be your master, and you'll use one to serve the other. But you can't serve both at the same time. It's God or mammon, God or money. Is money the primary, you might say, well, I, I think I'm chasing after God, but, you know, money is still very important. But is money the primary filter in your decision making? You know, I've been guilty of this, and I'm sure most of us have, saying, well, I just can't afford that. And if, if affordability is the primary objective or the primary filter as far as what you're going to do or what you're not going to do, perhaps money has too much control on your life. I don't allow myself to say I can't afford things because my dad's rich. <laughs> Amen? And you've got the same dad I do, so you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, God is rich. My spiritual dad, my spiritual father is so rich, there's nothing I can't afford. So affordability is not the issue. Is money the primary reason for stress and anxiety in your life? 
If money is the primary reason for stress and anxiety in your life, then perhaps you're too focused on money. Do you, do you find it hard to give generously? Do you have consumer debt? Now let me, I think we all probably have consumer debt. Do you have excessive consumer debt? To the degree that you're in debt, you're, you could say you're kind of a slave to those payments, right? You're a slave to the payments that you have to make every month. So, you know, uh, debt to some degree is probably unavoidable in America. You know, to the degree that you're in debt, you're a slave to those payments. So don't be so focused on the finances. Be more focused on Jesus. There's a scripture in Proverbs chapter 19, that, cha Proverbs 19, 17, that says, He that has pity on the poor lendeth to the Lord. Another translation says, He that gives to the poor lends to the Lord. And that which he hath given shall God pay him back. So, in other words, if, if somebody asks you for money, just give it. There, there, there's a little bit of wisdom that needs to be used to balance that. I'm not just saying give all your money away. But, but if somebody asks, if somebody ha is in need, give it, not expecting anything in return from that person. God says he will pay you back. Okay, so from your perspective, you're just giving the money away, but God sees it almost like a loan where you're, you know, you're giving it to him, but God's going to pay you back. And I believe God means what he says in scripture. You know, he's not a man that he should lie. If he says he's going to pay you back, he's going to pay you back. Praise God. So we, again, what I said earlier, our, our biggest problem, I think, is that we just simply don't believe in our heart of hearts. We don't believe that God really means what he says. If we believe God's word, if we believe that he means what he says, then generosity should be easy. Being focused on Jesus, more focused on Jesus than we are our money, then, you know, that, that should be natural. It should be an effortless lifestyle for us if, we're, if we really believe that God means what he says. So, you know, Jesus doesn't say that it's wrong to have things, but you know, you should see whatever you have, whatever things you have in life, see them as a gift from God. And you might say, well, I worked hard to buy that. <laughs> but God's the one that gave you that job. God's the one that gave you the ability. The scripture says he gives us the power to gain wealth. He gave you that ability to gain that money and see whatever possessions you have as a gift from God. There, there's no biblical, let me make this clear though, there's no biblical New Testament obligation to tithe or to give any specific amounts or percentages to the church. Because it's so easy to lust after money and the, and the things it can provide, God has established a system whereby prosperity is a byproduct of putting him first. In other words, he tells us not to seek after the things, but to seek him. And after we, as we seek him, he'll provide the things. That's Matthew 6.33, which again is not supposed to be part of this sermon. It's a sermon I'm going to give in three weeks from now, <laughs> Matthew 6, 33. He, tell, he makes it very clear, don't seek the things. Seek Jesus. Seek his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. And he'll take, he'll take care of the things. Praise God. That's God's economy. Praise the Lord. So godly character traits are more important than financial wealth. So what are you pursuing? What are you valuing? Pursue greater treasures than what you see on, on earth. Gr pursue greater treasures than what you can possess naturally. In 1 Timothy chapter, is that what I have next? 1 Timothy? Yes, 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. This, this is something that I was looking at this week, and this, there's so much truth in this. this is, it, it's almost a good way to summarize what, what I've been saying in maybe a more concise manner. <laughs> Godliness with contentment is great gain. This is God's economy. You know, we think that gaining more and more things, more and more money, more and more possessions is great gain. No, he says godliness. How many godly people here today? <laughs> he has given you the gift of righteousness. You are godly in God's perspective. Godliness with contentment. In other words, are you content? Are you content with where you are? A lot of times people just aren't content because they want more. They want more and they want more. 
And they're just not content with where they're at. Paul said, whatever state I'm in, I'm content. I've been rich and I've been poor. I've had things and I've had nothing. Whatever state I'm in, I'm content. He, he's been on top of the mountain and he's been in prison. You know, so he said, whatever state I'm in, I'm content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's God's economy. That's God's prosperity. To be content with whatever status you're in. For we brought nothing into this world, we can take nothing out of it. Notice verse 8. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. <laughs> Sounds pretty simplistic. And, you know, if, God, if you have the, your basic needs supplied, there, there shouldn't be any stress to just gain more and gain more and gain more. But he, he doesn't say getting rich is wrong. In fact, he says those who want to get rich, I think what he's painting here in verse 9, is those who chase after riches. If your primary objective is to get more and more wealth, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So he's saying if your objective in life is just to gain more and more wealth, there, there's no scriptural statement against it, but there, there are traps along the way. There's going to be anxiety. There's going to be uh, all kinds of snares of the enemy that he will throw in your way. There will be temptations, there will be traps, foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. He says in verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, again, it's not, some people will quote that and they'll say, well, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. No, he doesn't say money is the root of all evil, but the love of money, the idea of the, a passionate desire to gain more and more and more. It's like, we could say a lust for money, a, a, an, an elth, unhealthy desire to gain and gain and gain and gain financially. He says that's the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money. So this is what he's talking about. People who are eager for money. It's like that's their single focus. Instead of being single-minded or single-eyed, as Jesus said, on Jesus, they're single-eyed or single-minded on gaining more and more wealth. And what happens, according to verse 10, they wander from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. So there's negative side effects or consequences to, to chasing after the wealth of the world. Skipping down to verse 17, we see he says, command those who are rich, nothing wrong with being rich. He acknowledges that there are some in the church who are rich. Command those who are rich in this present world. So he's talking about people that are naturally rich in this world, command those who are rich in this world, in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. So again, it's not the problem with having the money, but where's your hope? Where's your confidence? Where's your faith? Where's your trust? Is, is your hope in your wealth, which is so uncertain? But he goes on to say, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides with everything for our enjoyment. Now, I think these, this, this statement in verse 17 is so powerful because he's saying if you have wealth, that's great, that's fine, but don't put your hope in your money. Don't put your hope in your wealth. Put your hope in God. Put your hope in Jesus. Focus on him. And he goes on to say he will richly provide everything. That's the same thing he said in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be added. Seek, seek him, put your hope in him. He will richly provide everything. And notice those last two words of verse, or those last three words of verse 17, for our enjoyment. God is not against you enjoying a good life here on earth. He wants to provide you. But his way of providing God's economy is not from you chasing after the things, but to chase after him or to be fully focused on him. And then he'll take care of the things for our enjoyment. Praise God. So he says, command them and do good or command them to do good and be rich in good deeds. <laughs> not legalistically and not ritualistically, but be rich in good deeds from the spirit within you, be, be doing good. Be doing good things, again, prompted by the spirit on the inside of you. So command them to do, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous 
and willing to share. So again, he's not against the wealth, but it's your attitude, it's your motive, you know, the, your focus. And be, he tells you to be generous and be willing to share. Whatever God has blessed you with, thank God for it. It's a blessing from him. And he tells you to be rich in good deeds and be generous and be willing to share. Verse 19, in this way they will lay up treasure. Now this brings us back to what we were talking about in Matthew 6, building up treasure. So he brings us back into focus here. In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves and a firm foundation for the coming age that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. <laughs> take hold of the life that is truly life. Praise God. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, it says, set your affections on things above, not on the things of this earth. So again, this is just reminding us that the same thing all these other verses were saying. Stay focused on Jesus. Stay focused on God. Stay focused on the things of God. And, and not on the things of the earth. And he'll take care of all the things of the earth. You don't need to be focused on them. Just one more scripture I want us to look at, and that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. Because, you know, the, initially when I first started preparing this sermon, I thought I was going to be talking more about money, but it's not really about money. It's about, you know, you can, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And it's not just about money. It's about investing your time, your talents, and your treasure. Not as works. Not investing your time and your talents and treasure as a form of works, but as a form of, you know, one person put it this way. When you're, when you're, when you're born, you have natural traits, right? You, uh, perhaps you have a, a tendency to break the commandments. That's your natural tendency when you're born. But when you're born again, now you have the Spirit of God influencing you. You have been birthed by the Spirit of God himself. You have been birthed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces holiness in you. So your natural, your natural tendency should not be towards sin anymore, but it should be towards righteousness. Your natural tendency should not be towards evil, but towards good. So doing good works is something that I believe is like a fruit. It just grows from, from within you if you're truly born again, if you're truly in relationship with him, if you're truly single-minded on Jesus and his kingdom, th doing good deeds is a natural thing that should be effortlessly flowing through us, as well as the things that I talked about today as far as generosity and, and focus on God's economy and not man's economy. But 2 Corinthians 9, verses 7 and 8, Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly nor of necessity. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. This is basically telling us that, that that transformation has taken place on the inside of you if you're born again. And you don't need someone to tell you what to do with your money. You don't need a church or a pastor to tell you you have to give 10%, like most of the churches will tell you, that you have to give 10%. I, I Just this past week I saw a, a preacher on television, one that I respect a lot, but he was saying that if you don't give your tithes, you're under a curse. There, there is no such curse in the New Testament. You know, the, Jesus was cursed for you. There is no curse for the believer. And, you know, so, so don't, let, don't let the religious preachers tell you that you're under a curse when God's word tells you that Jesus became your curse for you. You're not under a curse. Praise God. So... Whatever you, whatever, th this is, this is new covenant giving right here. Whatever you have purposed in your heart, whatever the spirit of God is directing you to do from the inside out. So let him give, not grudgingly or of, ne or of necessity. So if you are in one of those churches with, that tell you, you have to give, you're giving of necessity. But God loves a cheerful giver. And I, I really like verse eight where you, because there are seven absolutes in verse eight that shows us how generous God is towards us. God is able to make all grace, not a little bit of grace, but all grace abound towards you that you always, not sometimes, but always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. There are seven words that are that, that I, I've underlined them in my Bible where it's it's like God is not limited. We need to to 
get past the idea of, of how limited we are. <laughs> if God is your father and he is your source, you're not limited. And God, God is able to bless you far beyond anything that we could ask or think. And the, 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 the repetition of words like every and all and abound, you know, God is showing you here in verse 8 that he wants to bless you richly. There is no limit to his wealth. And if he's your dad, he's your spiritual dad, he's your heavenly dad, we should not be worried about finances. Finances should not be a concern. So we need to just be single-focused, single-minded, single-eyed, as Jesus said it in, in Matthew 6, on him and on his kingdom, and, and he will take care of everything else. He will prosper us, he will bless us, and he'll take care of everything. Praise God. Let's meditate upon the words of this song. And where it talks about the glory of God coming into this house, don't think of the house or this room. Think of this room. Let the glory of God consume this room. All right?
Amen. I hope so, anything that I said this morning, I, let me make it clear, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and I hope nothing that I said is taken as condemnation towards giving or anything like that. You guys have been very generous, and I appreciate all the giving. That that really was not the, the point of the sermon. But there, there's two main issues that, two main areas that we face in this world. It, it's like the devil tries to trip us up left and right, and, and it's the areas of health and finances. <laughs> health and finances. And the world will tell you, the religious world will tell you that these are just things that we have to accept. You know, whatever whatever your health is or whatever your finances are, you just have to accept it. But God's word tells us that he wants to bless you with health and he wants to bless you financially. That he himself is your health and he himself is your reward. Okay, so w the point of the sermon is to just be focused on Jesus. Don't be focused on on the health crisis, crisis that you may be going through. Don't be focused on financial crises that you may be going through. Focus on Jesus, and he promises to take care of these things, and he's not a man that he should lie. So the point of this sermon is to, is to get you to trust Jesus. Fully focus on Jesus, fully focus on Jesus, not on the things of this world, and he'll take care of these things. From just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church in Northern Virginia, thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. I'm Ken Miller. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net or rolw.org. At our website, you can get information about the church, the media ministry, the outreach ministries, the, the missions outreach, the Bible college, and various coming events. Our mailing address is Post Office Box 772, Annandale, Virginia, 22003. Our meeting location is 45449 East Severn Way, Sterling, Virginia. Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. God bless you.